Hello and welcome to Audiovisual Cultures with me, Paula Blair. For any regular listeners, I'm sure you'll be very pleased to hear that we have been rejoined by film historian Dr. Andrew Shale, as well as very special guest Anuja Shri. And we're going to talk about a Hindi film from 2015 called Tamasha, written and directed by MTS Ali. We are going to get into this in quite a lot of detail. The film is available currently on Netflix. This is recording in September 2020, so if you're listening around that time, the film is on Netflix if you want to have a watch at it. It's quite a complex film and we get into quite a lot of plot details. And just a warning, if you do decide to watch it, there is quite a lot of strobe lighting, certainly at the beginning and I think again towards the end, so just be aware of that. It's a really raucous, quite fun film, but we're going to get into quite a lot of detail about it. So I do hope, whether you see the film or not, I do hope you enjoy the discussion and we get a lot of enlightenment from Anoja about Indian film very generally, especially contemporary Indian and Hindi film and thinking about well maybe a bit of difference between well what's a Hindi film and what's a Bollywood film and that sort of thing. Before we get into all of that huge thanks to our members at patreon.com forward slash AV cultures for all your support it is so valued and important for anybody else who would like to support the podcast but you're not sure about a regular payment you can also give one off donations to help out at buymeacoffee.com forward slash PEA Blair or of any amount to paypal.me forward slash PEA Blair. It really helps with covering costs of things. But if you don't want to give any money at all or you can't or for whatever reason, keep sharing, keep liking, tell your friends, tell anybody you know who might be interested that this is happening and do share the podcast. That would be great. And do subscribe wherever you listen to your podcasts. That includes YouTube if you want to see the full videos of these. I will be back at the end with other ways that you can get in touch. But for now, I really hope you enjoy this conversation with me, Andrew, and Arnoja. Andrew, you have not been on the podcast for a wee while. Dare I ask, how are you? I'm so angry at how little I've been involved in the podcast recently. Are you? You've, really? You've been having such dalliances with so many other people. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it, you're, you're so lucky you got me back. I'm fantastic, Dr. Blair. How are you? Uh, I'm I'm hanging in there, thanks. Yeah, um, I'm really really thrilled to be joined tonight by Arnoja Shri. Arnoja, would you like to say hi and tell us a wee bit about yourself? Of course. Well, I'm Arnoja. My full name is Arnoja Shri. So, in case anybody has uh, problems pronouncing it, you can just call me Arnie. Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm, I'm, I'm an international student here at Newcastle. Well, I used to be. Um, I've just finished my um, master's in film. And before uh, film, I've done a degree in literature. So my bachelor's is in literature. And then, well, I switched majors, came here to do film because I was so fascinated with everything that I had seen ever since I was a child. And I think this is the opening line of my personal statement. Where, that I had sent to the college, it said that um, you are so fascinated by films that you actually become like the characters and the narrative. So you get oh. so sucked into it. And <laughs> all my life, like people have made fun of this thing. But like, while I was contemplating what to do for my master's, I realized if I am so into it, then might as well do a bit of venturing into how things plan out and what actually goes behind in the films and why is it that we find it so fascinating and ever since I've done the masters I feel like that curiosity has only gone deeper wow. instead of being um, satisfied so that's that and I I've done my dissertation in um, actually my dissertation is uh, inspired by the film that you're talking about mm-hmm. I'm gonna discuss so um, it, it was really interesting that uh, everybody, uh, like ever since I knew about this episode, I was I was really moved by the fact that people see the film in the same light that I have. There is so much to unpack there. And I think I've, by now I've seen it like six, seven times. Wow. So, <laughs> so if, if I really like films, I watch it a lot. 
a lot. So yeah, that's, that's, I think that's one thing about me that I, I love anything that has to do with arts, be it music or film or even photography. I love the fact that sim, cinema sort of brings everything together. So I think that's mm. one of my passions in life to look at these various bits and find out how they work together. Now, we just we need to point out here that Arnojia yeah. has submitted her dissertation for her master's degree about a week yes. ago. Yes. And so is now entirely free of being one of my students. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, and can um, uh, tell us what she really thought about a year of being a member of Film Nerd Club. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm sure is, I, I'm, I'm a richer person for it, Andrew. Um, so we're just going to ask you a bunch of questions for the next hour. Yeah, yes. lovely. So great to hear your energy, your enthusiasm for the subject. So um, I think a master's is a really special thing. It's of, of my degrees. It's my favorite one. <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> so, yeah. Awesome. So we are talking about now, we don't know the correct pronunciation, so please correct us all the time. Mm -hmm. Tamasha, is that right? Or is it said a different way? It's Tamasha. It's very, very oh. subtle. Tamasha. Oh. Yes. <laughs> so you could just be shitting us up, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Tamasha. Um, Arnaud, yeah. would you be happy to just for listeners would you be happy to outline the film a little bit i know it's a really complex film but would you be able to try to sum it up a bit for us so i've i've read a lot of reviews about it and i've written some as well and the film is actually it can be seen from so many perspectives mm -hmm. that there isn't like a definitive story going around i think so so uh, from all the times that I've seen the film, sometimes I've seen it from the perspective of a storyteller telling the story of his life. Sometimes it's a love story. Sometimes it's, it's just a narrative that the, sometimes you feel like it's the director, it's his autobiography in a way. That's what I thought for a long time. But the story is essentially about this guy who was named Wade. And Wade and Tara, they, accidentally meet in Corsica and they go and get into a few adventures, go back home and meet and somehow the energy that is between the dynamics has completely shifted. Um, for Tara, she, she is the same throughout. She, so she's trying to understand what has changed in Wait and what has changed in their relationship, but uh, he doesn't seem to give any answers. So the film is really in a way about Wade and Tara discovering what Wade is all about because he's the one who's the mystery here. And she, I sometimes feel like she is the, they're the same people, very, very similar in nature. But Wade is, um, like Tara is what Wade aspires to be. Somebody who can claim all of their sides and every personality, every aspect, all the dark and the bright bits of your life. And Wade is somehow stuck in a labyrinth that is our modern life. And it's one thing after the other, it's a race. And people are just putting so much energy and effort into something that they don't even feel passionate about. And it's meaningless, but you have to do it because it's your responsibility because that's what we've been taught. So Indian, it's a lot about how um, Indian uh, youth people my age go about in their lives and I think I'm at the same turning point as well so it's it's a really interesting film about how young people deal with career relationships themselves what they want to do in life their families yeah and it's it's quite a star-studded film both in front of and behind the camera isn't it yeah it so is. can you tell us about who was involved in making it so the director is Imtiaz Ali. He's one of the greatest contemporary directors in India right now. Uh, the music has been composed by A.R. Rahman. Again, one of the like most respected names in Indian cinema when it comes to music. And uh, the film lead uh, is Ranbir Kapoor, who is uh, considered one of the very versatile actors in Bollywood right now. 
and Deepika Padukone has is very a very successful actress. Uh, she's done um, Hollywood films as well, so it's it's definitely a very star-studded cast. But I think what sets it apart from the commercial Bollywood films is the fact that it has substantiality in it. Like there's quality, there's content going on, which is sometimes missing from other films. Um, so yeah, and Imtiaz Ali usually the director, he usually, he's written the script as well. And he usually works with these kind of narratives with young people and all the kind of things that they face in life. It goes from very grotesque and abuse and trauma to love stories as well. It's all sort of woven together. Brilliant. And so the term Tamasha and um, that that's to do with theatre, isn't it? It's a type of yeah. theatre practice yes. and there's a huge amount of theatricality in the film. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about that? So Tamasha is, um, so in, a, in India we have a sort of theatrical play form. Um, it's usually played by young students in universities and schools. So they go out on the, either of their, they either perform on stage or they go out and perform it in public. And it's a very impromptu thing. And they, they would perform the same play over and over again. So this is the thing that you would find, find in urban spaces. When you go to more rural areas, you'll find um, things like Ram Leela happening and I'm, I've, I'll tell you what it is. So uh, do you remember in the beginning of the film, you see all the plays happening mm -hmm. and there are people dressed up in all sorts of costumes. Yeah. So that's the actual Tamasha. That's where the word comes from. So it's just a play that goes on for pure entertainment. And it happens on festival uh, and like occasions whenever it is celebrated, a group of people would perform and it would include people from villages, you know, people who are mm -hmm. neighbors. So everybody does it. It's, um, it's a thing to celebrate. They present the narrative, which is related to the festivals. And it's just a way of appreciating the traditions and the myths and where our culture comes from. But in t quite tellingly, during that, the opening sequence where we see yeah. the young, of course, I'm calling him Ved. Yeah, babe. We see the, the young yeah. Ved um, yeah. as, a, as a boy watching these performances. Right. It's also intercut with him watching performances of Shakespeare plays as well. Yeah. And when he first meets uh, Tara as an adult, mm -hmm. the first thing she learns about, first thing he learns about her is that she's come to Corsica because she likes Asterix in Corsica. Yeah. So the, the film just, it kind of insists that the, the, this, this category of Tamasha, that it includes mythologies and mm -hmm. storytelling traditions from well outside India as well. Definitely, yeah. Uh, now, the, the fact that it opens as a, on, on a play mm -hmm. was truly baffling. Yeah. Now, now <laughs> this, this, you've mentioned, and when we were discussing Imtiaz Ali before, that he's, he basically counts as a postmodern director. Mm -hmm. uh, so just for the benefit of people listening to and watching this who haven't seen it, can you explain what the whole purpose of this play opening sequence is? Because it's the play that we open on. It isn't a piece of traditional Tamasha, is it? Yeah. It's, it's a much more, con um, oh, what would the term be? It's a much more commercial form of urban theatre that goes on in a very large auditorium that's that's new right. and it's it's very high you know, the lighting's really amazing and it's huge it's what we call spectacular theatre right um and it's completely unexplained <laughs> yeah. and and uh the who we le later learn is the main male character we see him portrayed in the form of a robot walking mm -hmm. on a treadmill which is why I say it's truly baffling, <laughs> because that metaphor is only explained after about an hour and a half. Yeah, towards the end of the film, really. Okay, so can you explain for our listeners and viewers what the whole point of that framing theatre performance is? So when I first watched The Masha, after two hours, I was like, okay, fine, this is a beautiful film, but I don't understand anything. <laughs> like, I have no idea what just happened. 
So I had to watch it a couple of times to really get what he was saying. And believe it or not, this film didn't work on box office. It did really oh. purely. Oh. And it's, it's actually the internet where the people have started appreciating it because they downloaded it and, and watched it a couple of times to actually understand what's going on. So this is something that I discovered recently that in the starting song, there's a frame where, before the intertitle appears where the camera sort of zooms into Wade's face. Is it a zoom? I mean, I, I think it is. It's a little bit of zoom. I also, or is it a dolly in by any chance? Uh, I think it was, I've, I mean, I've, you could be right. Honestly. I've got the film open right here. <laughs> <laughs> we have a pattern among us, here we go. That's my, job. That's my sole job in teaching on the MA in film is to go, is it a zoom? Really? Yeah. Um, Very precise usually, of yeah. the aesthetics on yeah. this podcast. <laughs> you, usually the answer is no, it's not. It's, it's, it could be a dolly because it's literally, it lasts a split second. Okay. <laughs> it's very, very minor. Maybe you are right, Andrew. It is a dolly shot. But right. the thing is, we go forward and it just blanks into a black screen. So I usually think that at that point, the play begins because even though he's trying to uh, portray a story to his, intra his diegetic audience, who we do not see at that point. Mm -hmm. So it could almost appear as if he's doing a play just for us, the mm -hmm. extra diegetic audiences. But it seems that he starts telling a story in his head instead of doing it on the sort of theater like style. It's not happening in reality. It's actually happening in his head. Mm -hmm. So before he performs it in front of the audience, He's actually sort of giving us a flashback of what has happened in his life. And when he starts doing this, he himself, he makes himself a character because in the song, all the imagined bits come into with a sort of grained aesthetic. And if you guys have noticed in the song, he features and Tara feature as well mm -hmm. for brief seconds and they come in of that grained aesthetic as well. So I think it's, him trying to show his narrative through a flashback sequence. And it only closes out when we finally reach towards the end of the film and we see that, oh, so he's, the play is actually going on and we were in his head the entire time. And that's where we come out. And yeah, I, I really think that the entire film is literally just a flashback sequence. Mm. Well, the, 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 after the opening, that opening frame bit with the, the play with Wade as a robot, Mm -hmm. And and then after the the opening song, Charlie Gahani. Um, oh no, actually no. After the opening sequence and before mm -hmm. Charlie Gahani, we have yeah. an intertitle that says "similar flashback." Yeah. So what that implies is that what we've just been seeing is is in the present, and that we've now started a flashback thing, and that yeah. therefore you know the vast majority of the film is just one huge flashback. Yeah. Now, of course, as as the pedant in the room that's how I would read the entire film. That what we get mm. is we get the opening of this play and then it pauses and then we have this mm. massive, almost two hour long flashback that explains how the guy who both wrote this play and starred in it did yeah. so, um, came up with it in the first place. And then everything makes sense in retrospect. Exactly. Um, or, as you say, it, that could be nonsense and we could just be seeing... Uh, and imagined uh, the the kind of mental landscape that would be happening when our main character is writing this play. That could be it, yeah. Yeah, was, but, but of course, it, when it ends, we see yeah. the the play conclude, and the play's autobiographical, so it kind of tells the story of his life, and he ends up having his robot costume stripped off him, mm -hmm. and, and you know, which is the story of him shedding his crap job. Um, and then Tara appears, yeah, off stage. And she, he, he kind of leans off stage and kisses her, and it's a big, it's a big uniting thing. So it, um, it seemed like that was him. The whole f purpose of that opening segment with the play and that closing segment of the play was to dramatize him removing himself from a life he didn't want, and then um, sim and getting himself into the life that he did want, while simultaneously getting the girl, because he was being yeah. kept kept from true happiness in loads of different ways. 
through being uh, stuck in this life he didn't want. Um, but even if even if it isn't the really kind of quite down to earth pedestrian reading where it's simply a non linear narrative rather than all happening it in is. his head that it's simply a non linear narrative, it's still a non linear narrative that starts off with this thing which isn't explained for two hours. <laughs> Why is this guy in a robot costume walking on a treadmill on stage? Yeah. And everything that happens in that little opening performance is meaningless until we've got a load of metaphors explained to us, you know, an hour later, an hour and a half later, and so on. Yeah. So for that, at least, it is proper postmodern, that it just goes, you just, you're just going to have to wait. Mm. Um. There's another thing, I don't know if you guys noted, noticed it, but uh, do you remember when he proposes to her? And then the, like, we see it, we see their conversation going on from a sort of full frame. And then she leaves and it almost seems as if his narrative starts from there on, because mm -hmm. up until now we had seen Tara and mm -hmm. then Wade's story starts. So that's also something that's very interesting. And then it contradicts this, the point that I was initially talking about that maybe it's his flashback sequence, but even in his flashback sequence, he's including hers as well. So. Yeah. The, this is it's one of those elements of this film that really struck me as, un, as unusual from a European cultural perspective is that it, it starts off focalized in one character Mm -hmm. <coughs> Hang on, COVID nineteen cough. <coughs> I'm, I'm, I'm here I am with the technology to mute that. Um, uh, it starts off focalized in his character as a boy, mm -hmm. and then it leaves off that, and it becomes focalized in her character mm -hmm. as an adult, meeting yeah. him as a stranger as an adult. Remains focalized in her when she leaves Corsica, leaves this holiday romance in Corsica. Uh, goes back to India, goes back to Kolkata with her. Um, to, very much delves into her psychological state. She gets a musical sequence um, explaining how she feels. And then when she finds him again, he's still this stranger. And then the, only at that moment when she goes, oh, I made a really big mistake. Uh, do we get uh, uh, any sense of what's been going on in his, in his head the entire time? Right. So, and it is I'm a big one for finding the slider and looking at just how far through a film we've got. And it, it's almost exactly at the halfway mark that that happens. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's something like, uh, it's, it's just a bit before the halfway mark. It's about one hour four. No, it's exactly the halfway mark. It's <laughs> at about yeah. one hour four out of two hours eight altogether of runtime. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're essentially being asked to wait for half of this film to get an explanation of why this character pretended to be someone who he wasn't during this opening Corsica. It's, um, it's really uh, funny sequence. because it's only after you finish the film that you realize that like 90% of the film is actually a meta narrative. <laughs> it's not even the actual narrative of the film. The actual one is the play. And we are inside yeah. the story of a story, which is, which is really baffling because it's literally all of the film. And yeah, yeah. The, it, this I, I've, I spend a lot of time when I'm teaching dwelling on films like um, Saving Private Ryan, which have really tiny frame stories. So we have some sort of present day event that lasts for about 10 seconds <laughs> and then boom, we're back into the past. And by, after about an hour and a half of that, your average viewer has forgotten that we're still in a flashback. Yeah. Uh, or that, that, that they're even having some sort of present day thing that links you to the past through some flashback recollection that it even... Uh, is supposed to be what's happening so it becomes completely reasonable that the viewer sees things that the character doing the remembering in the present day couldn't possibly remember uh, so this does exactly the same thing it goes we're going to start you off in the present day uh and um and then just forget about that yeah <laughs> for about two hours <laughs> that's basically it yeah <laughs> now you, you you said that it, it has it's got more meat to it it's got more content than your average hindi musical film yeah and it is uh it's i don't want to just go tell us about your entire master's dissertation <laughs> <laughs> some elements have some elements to it that are quite nar narratorial in that the film's like it's, it feels like the film isn't just sitting back and 
rather objectively spectating on events that it's overtly saying things like it has a form of implicit personhood in it. And one of the, the most blatant ways that that manifests is the posters. Mm -hmm. Those, those yeah. kind of, um, they're, they're a bit like intertitles. They're in the style, I think of Toulouse Lautrec posters. Yeah. And they break the film up into, I think it's four different segments. I think there's four of them, maybe there's five, but the first mm -hmm. one is called Tejas Gold. Yeah, I think. And then the second one's called Love Story. Uh, and they just go, all right, you've, here's a new chapter. Mm -hmm. And dividing something into chapters, it's quite a narratory thing to do, you know, giving something yeah. characteristic chapter titles. It's quite a narratory thing to do. So is that one of those elements that you see threaded throughout this film? That's definitely one of the things because I don't think it's very common, especially not a animated vintage thing going on. And it's a very consistent theme. Usually what intertitles do is that they would just appear. And you remember the one where it says Shimla. Yeah. Yeah. So it's usually like that. That's where they leave it. But this one puts more effort and tries to actually show it in a somewhat linear frame that this is how it happened. This is not something that's very common in Indian films, but um, I think what I'm leaning more towards is the fact that commercial Indian narratives, Bollywood films, essentially, do, they do not have a lot of complexity going on in their narratives. It's pretty easy to follow. There's, it's, it's a formula and they repeat the same formula over and over again. Um, this film is very different and Imtiaz Ali usually does love stories, but his love stories are a bit different from others. So this one I think is the one that like out, out does any of them, any of his films. And yeah, it's, it's very layered, definitely. I don't think a layering is a very common trait in Indian films, especially not in Bollywood mm -hmm. films. So yeah, that's something that, that's why I always think that this is something that's not, very unlike Indian cinema. I felt there was very much a, um, a European arts influence really strongly in it as well. Yeah. Well, our, our storyteller, one of the points that our storyteller character who's, who's telling stories to the young Wade at the beginning, one of the points that he d implicitly makes is these, these stories in Hindu mythology are in well, it's not in Hindu, it's, 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 in, it's Indian subcontinent mythology. Mm -hmm. um, these stories that we, we're used to, they are the relatives of stories that yeah. exist in, um, uh, in Europe, that exist in the Mediterranean, that exist in the Middle East. It just kind of sl slips back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. So I suppose that character as a, as a surrogate for the director is saying what the director is doing as well. Mm -hmm. That's slipping Pretty between much, styles. Yeah. Yeah, I'd actually seen um, an interview of Intiazli a few days ago. Um, it's on Netflix and it says it's, it's called Creative Indians. So you'd find a lot of good actors and good directors on there. So his interview was one of them. And he was talking about how he hates the story writing process, but he loves mm -hmm. directing it. And he has absolutely no background in direction, no connection to cinema industry he just happened to love films and somehow bumped into filmmaking because nothing else was working out for him and he says that he's uh, whenever he makes a film what he actually wants to do is he wants to put through a very emotional story because he's making a film about human beings and he says that he doesn't like to intellectualize, inte intellectualize things or make them seem complex or say that, oh my God, there's some grand mystery to the universe. He's not trying to do that at all. He just wants to present stories, basically, of people being people. So a lot of his characters, he um, has taken inspiration from his surroundings, how he goes about in his life. And he says that um, sometimes he doesn't even remember that he's doing this, but his, in his story writing process, these people translate into characters and when he's directing the scene and um, like one character says something to the other character, he'd be like, oh my God, this person had told me this years ago. And so it's a very subconscious emotional process for him to mm -hmm. genuinely 
make a story. I suppose that's what any of us are. We are vessels for the stories we collect throughout our lives. And I really get the sense that the film is, it's almost like a regurgitation of all the stories that Bed collects throughout his life in a way. Yeah. Is this, is, it's a very same, similar characteristic because if you see, even as a child, Wade is collecting stories from the storyteller, but he imagines mm -hmm. them happening to real mm -hmm. people around him. Mm -hmm. It just happens throughout his life. Mm -hmm. In part of the film, one of its crisis moments being that Wade goes to the, the now very, very old storyteller. Wade's an adult. He goes to the storyteller and says, tell me how my story ends. But, and the crisis moment is that the storyteller says to him, don't be an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to decide how your story ends. And to an extent, the, the, the film seems to be saying that there's a sensible limit to one's obsession with stories. Yeah. Uh, and that the, it's, it's just as important to try to create your own, mm -hmm. which means, uh, well, actually, does it mean trying to create something original as far as the film's concerned? Because the, I suppose what, um, uh, one of the, the early lesson in the film is that there are no original stories. There are these many, many stories are all very much related. There's even the bit where the story, storyteller talks about how um, just the names of characters in different mythologies are similar mm. enough to indicate that they're related. Yeah. Uh, and, and I suppose for, if Imtiaz Ali is trying to create a film which is unlike previous Indian uh, Hindi language films, that uh, he may feel that in, in, uh, in addition to paying homage to all these existing storytelling traditions, that he has to try also kind of assassinate them to go, uh, in order to do something new, I'm going to have to throw out expectations. And, mm -hmm. um, and that means having a character um, symbolically reject his childhood obsession with stories. Um, that may be completely wrong, of course. Um, um, it, what, yeah. what, see, see the um, the do the doing it on a on a on a stage element. Mm -hmm. uh, the doing it with element uh, kind of snapshots for your own life from your own life behind you element. Um, that that seems to be the thing that's that he is missing from his life is the ability to tell his own story is what's missing from his life so it may not even be whether the story is original or not that is the deficiency in him it's just the ability to be a storyteller right. so i suppose that bit with that storyteller saying to him no you have to finish your own story the 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 problem is not that his story might be unoriginal the problem is that he's not been the one telling it yeah, uh, and I suppose that does fit with the fact that for the for the first half of the film, he's a mystery. He's he's been this someone who other people encounter. Um, he's been this he's been this audience member when we did meet him as a child, uh, and and that may explain why it is that in the rough second half of the film, when it starts to the film starts to focalize in him, that he's so angry. Yeah, that was something that struck both Paula and I when mm -hmm. when he has that crisis. So he's he's been dumped by Tara because she goes, oh, having met you in in the flesh in real life, not not pretending to be the character who who you pretended to be in Corsica. I I, I you're a different person. I kind of find you boring. I don't want to do this. Mm -hmm. And she says no to his proposal. Uh, then suddenly we're focalized in him. And from that moment onwards, he's, he's having this kind of disintegration where, and, and of course, initially it seems that he's disintegrating because he's been dumped, but then it becomes apparent that he's disintegrating because he realizes how far he's gone from his story loving youth, that he's become uh, a, a very boring workaday office employee. And, right. and he's become that in his everyday life as well. Uh, so, the, there was that, that scene when um, uh, he goes to her apartment. Mm -hmm. it's, I think it's the next scene after she said, no, no, no I, I can't marry you. You're a different person from who I thought you were. Yeah. That scene where she goes, he goes to her apartment and he goes, he just wants to explain. But every few sentences, he just breaks into a shout. 
Mm-hmm. And that was one of those moments where I think, I might, do I remember correctly here, Paula, that you, when you and I were watching it, we went, oh, this is, this is kind of borderline violent, the way that he's <laughs> yeah, shouting at her. Yeah, over. Yeah, it's a very yeah. fine line. I think it was more when, much later, when they meet in a bar, and she's trying to be quite friendly with him, and he gets, it gets really aggressive, but then she's, um, she's almost scared and she's apologizing and she says, oh, well, I'll, I'll take the ring. I'll be with you. It's all fine. And it feels like, gosh, that's almost like an abusive relationship. It's quite scary. So the tone really shifts in quite a scary way, I think. But I don't know if that's a, maybe it's a cultural thing or I, I'm not sure. But yeah, it just felt like, because the rest of the film is so joyful, it feels. And um, so I, d- I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. Um, well, one of the interpretations of the film is that Ved actually has a multiple personality disorder. Yeah. So Would explain a lot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, I, I not to like to uh, look at it from a sort of disorder thing, but I like to think that, um, you know how you go through life and you don't really find connections with anybody. And mm-hmm. even if like you're talking to somebody and they, you tell them, okay, I'm fine. And you're not really fine. They don't see it. They'll mm-hmm. just believe you by word. But if somebody actually really sees you and feels that connect with you, they will know that you are going through something mm-hmm. or like they'll know the real you just through that connection that you guys have. And that's how I like to think that Ved actually has never found anybody who is as passionate as he is or who thinks and feels and acts the same way as him. So when he meets Tara in Corsica, they get on really well and they find this connection between themselves. And when he goes back, he gets into a role because that's exactly what he said that I came to Corsica and I'm going to play a role. I didn't come here to be myself who I'm every day of my life. So when he goes back into this robotic routine of his and he realizes that this person that I had a connect with, she's the same as she was before. And then she starts pointing it out in him. And he's like, who are you to tell me who I should be? I've lived so long like this and I'm fine and everything is fine and balanced in my life. The way it's supposed to be, everything is normal, you know? And she's like, no, you're not normal. This is not normal. See, this is actually you playing a role. And he's just, he feels called out. He feels like somebody's just like seen his truth basically and exposed him to Mm -hmm. himself so I think that that point of somebody telling you something about yourself that you have never noticed I think that's where he has a breakdown and he realizes Mm -hmm. that all of his life has basically been a facade Mm -hmm. that he has created in his own life because he's not brave enough to um live his own story he's he's heard all these stories since his childhood and he tries to live in them in his head but he forgets that he himself is in a story that's his story all of us have our own realities and narratives going on and he forgets that he is alive in one that's why i think i the storyteller scene where you know the end towards the end when they finally meet that's mm-hmm. one of my favorite bits from the film because he literally asks him like what is your story? You have to, you're the one who's going to decide that. I can't tell you that. And even though all of the stories around the world are the same, and that's what Mtiaz Ali was trying to point out, that we are all living the similar lives, but in different clothes and different sort of forms. But like, that doesn't mean that, you know, you can look at another person's life and go by how they have done things. Not really. You can't get inspired from a story, but you can't live it that way. You have to find that originality within you and learn how to implement that in your life. So I think that's one of the major things that Imtiaz is trying to talk about. And that's what Wade gets to realize in his story. Like the film is actually him just realizing this, that I'm a story and I have to decide how I write it. It's um, it's appropriate then that the the revealed source of Wade's uh, metaphorical enslavement in this robotic job mm-hmm. is his dad's insistence that he yeah. 
uh, get do what is it an engineering degree? His his, yeah. his dad just you have to go go to university and do this. Mm-hmm. Um, and en- enough dreaming. Uh, I basically dictate your career to you. Mm-hmm. And so it's appropriate that the way that he escapes that family drama is by telling a story. Yeah. He, as an adult, he just sits down in front of his dad, who's been constantly disapproving of him and is now even disapproving of him uh, now that he's an adult and he's having this crisis where he, he realises that he's, he's become a bit of a robot. Still is disapproving, is still saying, why not just buck your ideas up and get back to work? He sits down in front of his dad and his, what seems to be his mum and... His grandmother. Grandmother, yeah. yeah. Sits, down in fr- sits down in front of the oppressive family and mm. tells them a story. And, the, and it's the story of himself and what he's going to do uh, to escape this imprisonment. And then that's the moment of completely implausible <laughs> reversal of his dad's position. His dad yeah. just he has, does that kind of melodramatic standing up and hugging somebody at the same time kind of that physical yeah. literally rugby tackling somebody kind of move um and i and i suppose that that uh that's that's on the literal level it's like you know it's, it's a character going i refuse to be part of this particular family mm. um control system anymore but it's also it's figuratively um uh, pushing back against um, story conventions because it is such a convention in Indian film. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I speak from so much authority. Here. Such a convention <laughs> in Indian film that um, one's family's desires for you are determining of your life choices. Yeah. Uh, now, so, so I w- I've, I've been meaning to ask, is... There's, you've pointed out various elements in which this film is, it it tries to break break apart the mold of, um, of, of Bollywood storytelling conventions, but at the same time, it does seem to stick with some of them. Now, correct yeah. me if I'm wrong here, but the the exotic location, mm-hmm. which is not in anywhere in the subcontinent at all, mm-hmm. where a couple of young cosmopolitan characters have a, a whirlwind romance isn't that relatively characteristic of of uh recent indian films a lot of them like <laughs> that's that's the, my dissertation mentions this that post 1980s i think just shooting in international locations became such a thing for like um the indian directors because what they wanted was to increase the element of identification with their other audiences and to make the film more relatable to like show that okay we can reach beyond the diaspora basically so that's why you would always see a lot of um, globalized aspects in in films one of them is shooting like films in international locations and sometimes it's literally just a song but Mm -hmm. you have to bring that one element of going beyond India, going beyond the Indian culture and just, yeah. And is, uh, see, we're talking here from the total experience of me having seen about five or six films <laughs> and, and Paula and I having seen Tigers in the Hay at the, no, it's, it's High, is it High? Hay? Hey. 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 Having, hey. seen, having seen it at the Metro Centre Odeon recently <laughs> and it starts right. off in, in Switzerland. <laughs> starts off in Switzerland. Most of the drama takes place in somewhere in the Middle East yeah, um, on a spy mission. And then it concludes in Greece. Mm-hmm. And we have almost exactly the same kind of structure in Tamasha in that it starts, well, it doesn't quite start after those opening sequences. It starts in Corsica. And mm-hmm. then we have that seemingly completely pointless ending sequence <laughs> in Japan. Oh, yeah. yeah it's just, you know, it's another, <laughs> another exotic cosmopolitan location. Yes. So it seems that he, he may have had a quota. <laughs> you Possibly. have to, to, to two exotic locations. Um, and the, it may also be that, that that moment in the middle of the film where things get quite vicious, 
where he gets quite shouty and he and Tara get into what is nearly a fight. It's, it's really mm-hmm. interestingly choreographed, isn't it? Where she's trying to grab hold of him and he's trying to Oof. stop her grabbing hold of him and their arms get kind of tangled up mm-hmm. in each other. It's kind of elbows in ears kind of territory. <laughs> and, then, and, then there's, and then they both kind of collapse onto this, this desk and they've got their heads on the desk and I think he's mm. holding her head against the desk in a slightly joking but also slightly not joking kind of way. That mm. the tonal shift there was it was outside of the territory of romantic comedy because ordinarily the, the, the kind of the sphere of the genre of romantic comedy is that um, there'll, be, there'll be a kind of breakup and some rather melodramatic shouting at each other in the street but it won't get to the point where it's physically threatening. Yeah. Um, he- and that those tonal shifts, those seem to be endemic to mm. uh, to Bollywood films because of the masala um, principle. Now that might not apply at all anymore. Yeah. But um, this is is the principle, isn't it? Where you have to basically pack in about five different genres into the same film. That's so you, that's true. Yeah. You have to get in action and romance and comedy and musical, and and. Th- so, and Tamasha didn't do that, but mm-hmm. it seemed to be pulled in the direction, just slightly in the direction of doing that. Hence that rather in, uh, incongruous feeling bit in the middle where it really stepped outside of the, the boundaries of romantic comedy. So I know we're, we're kind of licking Intiaz Ali here by going, he's, he's really moving outside of the box. <laughs> but you can see bits of the box there, I think. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you guys a very interesting trivia about this, which I even learned like... So, like that, the song that where they sort of start getting into a fight in a bar, mm. that song was actually not entirely directed by M. Ali. He just yes. left the two actors to do improvise on it, and he never improvises. He he literally has said that if they improvise in acting, that's fine with me. But words and all, I I get to do that. That's my story. So I will tell them what to say and what not to say. These two actors were actually in a relationship with a very intense relationship ages Mm -hmm. ago and when this scene was happening everybody felt like it was not a way than Tara two actual people going through the whatever trauma was there left Mm -hmm. in their relationship that was coming out Wow. It's actually, the acting in that scene is different from the rest of the film. Like that Mm -hmm. just automatically comes out because it's so intense. And you see that a line of acting has been crossed and it's Mm -hmm. become a very own, like a very real life thing in its own way. So I think, yeah, like that's, it it was not him. It might not have been his intention to make it so um, out of like romantic comedy. But it just became its own thing. Mm-hmm. I wonder if he regrets it. <laughs> I, I don't think so because this this scene has been talked about a lot, and mm-hmm. if you YouTube this, I think there's a complete analysis of this that he has done himself. Yeah. yeah. So he it actually it's it's one of the people love this song and this scene the most throughout the film just because of that energy that the characters have. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's tremendous chemistry between these two actors and characters. And I was wondering if, um, before you mentioned that story, I was wondering if, because the film becomes so subjectively aligned with each of them at different times, Mm -hmm. if that was part of it, if there was a crossing over into a bit of reality, because, you know, was it maybe... Because when we remember things, we will add our own spin on it. You know, our memories are never yeah. fixed. You know, we will we will change them. We will warp them. We will imagine different outcomes for the same memory, or something from the past. And so I was wondering if you could read it like that, that maybe that's what one of them imagined was happening. Mm-hmm. But that's really fascinating that there's a tipping over into actual real life. Yes. And so there's the theatricality of the real on top of the theatricality that's going on in the film as well. It's really fascinating. It is. It is. Mm-hmm. It's exactly like um, like it, the fact that you can sense it means if that's what anybody who doesn't even know about their past probably thinks that mm-hmm. an element of 
acting and film and stories sort of crosses over and mm-hmm. it becomes a very real to real life thing right there mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I wouldn't take the job if it was an ex-partner who, <laughs> who was going to be playing opposite it's, it's different just, for it's, actors so. there's no amount of money there's <laughs> no, then, there's, it's it's <clears throat> i couldn't imagine like especially a love story yeah. and that to such an intense love story i i don't know how they did that but I would be throwing bricks. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're on the grown-up elements of this, uh, we have we have two questions for you. Um, uh, there's <clears throat> there's there seems to be a bit of taboo breaking going on in the Corsica segment. Mm-hmm. In that both of our main characters were drinking openly and enjoying it openly and not getting punished for it openly, and mm-hmm. they were they were doing plenty of kissing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then they just as she's leaving she seems resolved to leave and to, to to just do it without saying goodbye but then when the cab is just outside the hotel she runs back up to his room goes in takes off her shoes mm-hmm. and climbs into bed with him and it seems that what they do is they just they just do the, some kissing there mm-hmm. and i thought hang on she's taken off her shoes is that symbolic that they're doing more than just kissing? Yeah, basically, <laughs> yes. I mean, I, would, I was surprised because there is so little. Usually these days there are more, there are entire sequences around it. Like, and it's, it's, not, it's not that it's frowned upon anymore. Like in Indian narratives, you've got like kissing going on, public kissing, like, right. and everything, like intimate scenes do come on a lot which is something my mother has a lot of problems with. <laughs> so it's hard to watch anything with her anymore. <laughs> uh, and yeah. so, because so, um, the reason why we thought that might be a bit unlikely is that it, that it might just be she literally takes her shoes off and it's not a code for something. Mm-hmm. Is that she it does it code. while there's a, there's a cab waiting. <laughs> so if, if they do have sex, they, yeah. they either have it really quickly <laughs> or... Or, there you go. Or there you go. <laughs> they really test the patience of that cab driver. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's the who, former. Who... <laughs> <laughs> okay, and while while we're on grown up things, um, we noticed. I mean, we watched this on Netflix, right? And we know that mm-hmm. that's not necessarily how it would have appeared in cinemas. But um, mm-hmm. when when it when we watched it, um, it, of course, it's subtitled almost entirely in English in the version that we're watching. Even the points <laughs> where they keep they keep switching into English. Yeah. And you go, why am I watching? Why is this subtitled? But you know, just for cleanliness' sake. Um, th- there's that one moment where, sh- where they're in character mm, as the two mm-hmm. people they're playing in Corsica. And the, play- the people they're playing, one of them is an Interpol uh, agent. Police officer. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and Tara is claiming to be working for a local gangster. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then she just lapses into f- for for a moment into another character where she's saying, "Okay, uh, so obviously you brought me here for sex, right?" Mm-hmm. And then she lays out her price structure, mm-hmm. and 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 in the in the subtitles, of course, it said what she was talking about. So she mentions anal, she mentions doggy style, right? But at that mm-hmm. moment, I noticed that the audio cut out. Oh now, yeah, yeah. But- so- in, in some bits, you can't hear it, but obviously you do know what it means. So they cut out the actual word without actually cutting it out. So you just hear a little bit and then it cuts off. Mm. All right. Yeah. And so, so that's how it would have played in cinemas then originally when it came out, is that she says the yeah. beginning of the word for anal and then... Mm-hmm. All right. <laughs> um, I suppose that's a way of getting around censorship. Um, well... Well, it is, but I, actually, frankly, I was quite confused why they cut off the audio because if you watch any of the um, Indian films or web series nowadays, everything is so frank and out there. There's no regards for censorship at all, at <laughs> all, especially in oral languages because they do tend to show more um, raw conversations going on between characters. So. It, it was not necessary, really. Maybe it was a ratings mm-hmm. thing. You often hear about Could films be. make it, having tiny changes made to them right mm-hmm. at the getting rated stage just in order to get down to a PG-13, you know, or, or equivalent <laughs> Definitely. rating. Definitely. Yeah. 
Um, I think just um, while we're on language, because this is going to this is going to be a very silly British thing to ask, because um, obviously there's the legacy of colonialism, but um, I find it really fascinating that the the language dips in and out of English so often that um, you know they're speaking in Hindi, but then you'll get a word or a phrase in English and you know the the few the few Hindi films that we've watched together this is just a really common thing that happens and I I don't know if it's if it's generational or if it's always like that I don't know if if there's anything um if for for any other western Anglophone people watching it. Is there is there anything you think would be useful to point out to help us along with this? <laughs> well, I think that's a very common thing to do. I think uh -huh. you know, because you everybody has been taught English since they were children, so they mm -hmm. do apply it in how they converse with each other. I I would I would you would expect me to say that well this is how I talk with my parents, but no, this is actually how I talk with my grandparents as well. Right. So it's it's always been there. English has just always been there in our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So you'll find it, like a lot of films. Actually, this is this is going to be surprising that films tend to make their scripts more inclined towards Hindi, okay. and that's actually not how people in India talk. Right. So do you remember Andrew? You've seen Dev Das, the one with Sanjay Leela Bhansali. Um, no. <laughs> the the two thousand two film. Yeah. I know it's one of the most, it's like a landmark film of, of Indian mm -hmm. cinema history. Um, no, I haven't. No. Well, if you see something like that, and they talk purely in Hindi there, mm -hmm. it's not how we talk. So that's something that's just for the narrative purpose. But usually people just talk the way Vedantara talk. Mm -hmm. in and out only. This sees in for for people whose first language is English, the mm -hmm. phenomenon of switching is almost exclusively associated with being pretentious. Oh. It's almost exclusively <laughs> associated with switching into French to try to right. sound culturally sophisticated, and right. it's now known as the Del Boy Trotter phenomenon, which is <laughs> where almost invariably you get it wrong. Right. Uh, and so the switching is just associated with people being idiots in, in fiction. Um, <laughs> but if it's, you know, if it's a normal part of life, given that you live in a multilingual yeah. culture, then I suppose we're, we're looking at an attempt to try and make these characters relatable. Mm -hmm. that's, that's that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, I've, the, I've been to India a couple of times. And one thing I found is that the version of English that I encountered there, it felt like reading 18th century fiction. <laughs> it was an 18th century version of English where these, these words, these <laughs> naval words that we don't use in everyday English now had somehow found a place to survive. Um, yeah. a, a guy once was talking to me about yoga exercises that I could do in bed. And he said, you could do this in your cot. Hmm. And, and, and that's, what we, that's a term we use for um, what babies sleep in. Yeah. But it actually used to be the name for any bed that wasn't a hammock on ships mm -hmm. and so that word had survived in India as a result of unfortunate historical relationship <laughs> um, <laughs> right and, and where it hadn't survived here at all and so many elements like um, I've heard the word avail the verb avail used in India quite commonly we do yeah. we do we talk about how we might avail ourselves of a certain discount <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's, kind of, that's yeah that's how they talk they it's do oddly formal yeah, and, and you know, when you learn any language um, as a second language, what you tend to learn it as is a slightly older version of the language than what mm -hmm. is spoken by native speakers anyway. So, you know, um, you know, the French I learned in schools apparently is the French spoken by the grandparents of um, the current generation. So there's, it's, it's automatically going to happen anyway. Yeah. <laughs> um, t tell us about the music. <laughs> well, that's my favorite bit. Yeah. <laughs> well, the music is by Yair Rahman, and by now I'm pretty sure. I mean, <laughs> I think the entire world. If anybody's ever read my blog or my Instagram account, they know I love Yair Rahman. Mm -hmm. Like I praise the guy so much. Um, his his music is 
really, 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 really beautiful in this film mm-hmm. because it's like, every song is like a story on its own. Mm-hmm. And that's actually how I stumbled upon the concept of my dissertation that Chali Kahani is actually not a song, it's a narrative because there are repeated bits for sure, but the song is structured in the form of a play or multiple mm-hmm. stories happening at once. And then they are sort of, you know, intervening in each other's worlds. And so you've got like pairs like Romeo and Juliet, and then you've got Helen and Troy. And somehow Helen is with um, Romeo and <laughs> Troy is with Juliet. So it's like all meshed into one another. Um, that's one thing. And another, like the song, which is um, the one where they're fighting. Mm that has that actually does not function as a, a you know traditional duet it's more like the woman starts singing first then she finishes and then the guy he has been singing in the background of the female vocals and then he sort of takes his own verse so every song is um very very you know uh, different from another another Again, here, uh, the song which comes during Tara's narrative when she's upset and she's thinking about what's going on in my life. That song is Punjabi. Tara is not a Punjabi mm-hmm. girl. She's not mm-hmm. from Punjab, but it's a Punjabi song. You've got all the traditional singers and they are the actual sing- local singers of the area. So again, it's the sort of cultural um, interaction happening there. So like in in a traditional sense everything is very mixed into one another and that's another thing that complements the storyline because just like stories dipping into one another it's songs and the way they have been you know visualized or vocalized or composed they also sort of tag along the same parallel concept that everything sort of can everything can talk about another thing so like even though i am indian my life can be very similar to an English person. Mm-hmm. And just because we're different doesn't mean that there are different ways of living or different things are happening in these two areas, not really. So I think that's a similarity that, that music has in this film as well. And there's, there's a magical realist element to some of the songs, isn't there? In yeah. The, um, I think the one that's called Wata Wata Wata, the, mm-hmm. the one sung by the, the auto rickshaw driver. Yeah. That one, that one is shown to be taking place, to be performed in a very small musical venue. Mm-hmm. But then it keeps flicking to other locations to indicate that this is actually happening in someone's head and that he's mm-hmm. actually performing it sitting at a roadside cafe mm-hmm. without a musical accompaniment, without lights, without anything. So there's lots of... Um, <clears throat> showing us things as if they're happening in the diegesis where they're actually mm-hmm. in their internal scenes, they're imaginary scenes for one of the characters, if, if at all, you know, they could be imaginary scenes for some implicit narrator. So here I am pushing you back. <laughs> <It's fine. up. laughs> yeah, I mean, when I was watching the song last night, actually, I thought that when, when with stares so intensely at the rickshaw driver that it almost seems that in Wade's head the narrative control of the song has been gone to rickshaw driver and he's seeing him perform Mm. and sing about something that he is going through so in the starting initial part of the song then like vocal controls are over to the driver and then when he sees him in real life again just sitting there and you know just singing without any instruments he sort of you know come go comes out of his head and he's like oh shit this this guy knows what his story is but i don't and then he goes back into his mind again and takes so the, there's a switch in the vocal singers there it's not the same guy singing the entire song there's oh, two right. so initially the sing so then he like when he looks at the rickshaw driver singing he goes back in his mind and then he again starts singing in his flashback sequence and am i right in here and thinking that none of the people who we actually see singing uh, yeah. except for that that punjabi group mm-hmm. that, that that no one no one else is actually singing what we no. hear 
No. Okay, that it's all um, playback singers. Yes. Uh, no. Now, th now that is one of those very odd things yeah. about one of those elements of cultural difference that is that does tend to strike uh, Europeans as being a really weird way of doing films. But it's probably just more overtly the case in Hindi films than it is in musicals made elsewhere, because it's probably quite a common practice. I having would say someone, it, yeah. yeah. It's just that the voices are so much more in, more um, incongruous. This, this voice is very clearly not the voice that would have come out of this person's mouth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, um, what's it called? The, what's it called? Mata Gashti? Um, song, yeah. the one in, in Corsica. Yeah, the, yes. the singing there appears to be like, it's like the singers have been told to make it s even more shrill than they normally would mm -hmm. to indicate that this is not coming out of the mouths of these two people, even though that's how it's presented. I mean, mm -hmm. I may be way off on this. Um, um, this is something that I discovered when I was doing my dissertation, actually, that singers were chosen for their vocal abilities and how they can match to the tone of the singer. Oh. Just to make sure that the audience who is not aware of playback singing like you guys, you would oh. confuse it with the actual person singing. It's, right. made to, it's made to sound like that. So if you actually go to and check the tone, the tones really do match with the oh. actor and the singer. Except that again, he's his vocal capabilities. Yeah, he makes it shrill in one song, but he's more um, sort of subtle and hoarse in the other bits. But yeah, Matagashti, definitely, I think the shrilling more has to, it has to do with the theme of the song that it's so upbeat and they're so happy and excited. So I think that's, mm. that's the element that's trying to come out in the vocal tone. Mm. They're very catchy tunes as well. They're earworms. I've found myself, you know, they're going over and over in my mind actually for the past few days since watching the film. <laughs> really enjoying them. <laughs> the songs are catchy, yeah. I'll yeah. give you that. <laughs> Anojia sent me a playlist of up, upwards of 30 songs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think it was the ones that we were you were going to be working on for your dissertation. And one day, Paula and I just sat down and we just watched as many as we had time to watch. Oh, wow. <laughs> and um, Kun Faya Kun, that I, I cannot get that out of my head now. Oh, because it's, one, it's from one of Imtiaz Ali's earlier films. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's sung by a character played by Ranbir Kapoor. So the same person who plays Wade. Um, I, I, I am, I'm definitely in agreement that A.R. Rahman is quite a good composer. To, <laughs> he is like which is an understatement. Um, I mean, if you're interested in his music, like you see any, like even the best one, like the worst ones have the best music ever. And Rockstar is actually known for its music. And Kun Faya Kun is definitely one of the classics that Rahman has ever done because it brings out that Sufi um, element of the song. And this song is actually, the singers that you so, see in the visuals, they actually perform in the same spot, in the same masjid in India. And it's the same song. Hmm. So they've literally just been invited to the studio to record the track and they just sing it there. And then the vocals of other comp like singers are added. But yeah, it's the original song. Well, we've got our next um, podcast then, haven't we? Next episode. <laughs> we're going to have... We, see, we had a Sophia Coppola season uh, about a year ago. No, right. it's, so, it's longer ago. <laughs> was it? it was way back at the start, yeah. 2018. Was it two years ago? Yeah. Cause, things, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and this year has been a write-off, I know, because of <laughs> pandemic reasons. But yeah, a lot yeah. of the things you're remembering are from ages ago. <laughs> <laughs> we did, we, you know, do you remember, Anodja, that, that thing I did, which was a, a very thorough yeah. analysis of the thematic and stylistic signature of yeah. Sofia Coppola, yeah. and looking at all <laughs> of her commercial feature films. Uh, um, I, I did that because I had a, a dissertation student who was working on Coppola and mm. so I, I just had watched all of her films right. and because I'd done those um, Paula and I recorded podcast episodes and and so I thought well I've done most of the work now so I'll just do this <laughs> do this analysis. Um, Imtiaz Ali has directed what 10 12 films now? 
Yeah, not all of them are good, but <laughs> but you know, he has his good ones. The thing with him is that it's the same thing theme going on. Like mm. it's different, but it's almost similar because there's tr- there's traveling, there's self discovery, there's sort of spirituality, there's love, there's family, there's relationships. So different narratives, but the same things. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. And uh, you were originally going to write entirely on Imtiaz Ali for your dissertation, weren't you? So I it's was, shown quite some yeah. restraints that you worked on. <laughs> more than one director yeah <laughs> that's a hard decision but then i was like oh it's fine <laughs> yeah great um well i mean it's get, it's getting quite late we've been going for well over an hour now so <laughs> we've taken a lot of your time and you've oh, been <laughs> so informative it's been brilliant Arnaja, you mentioned that you, you have a blog and Instagram mm-hmm. and stuff. Would you like to just point people towards those? Mm, sure. Um, thank you so much for <laughs> giving that opportunity. Um, well, I have an Instagram um, account that, that's basically my name, but uh, it's literally at Arnaja Shri. So okay. I usually post reviews there and video edits my poetry. So I I started getting into film writing and review writing because of the poetry stuff. Just Mm -hmm. gave it a shot and it just happened. Um, So my film blog is the one where I post reviews of all the films that I'm reviewing. And I almost review one every week because I do it for the Courier, the university newspaper. Uh, Yeah. So um, you can find it at um, letters to film dot wordpress.com brilliant lovely great and is that just anything that's out at the minute or is it just anything at all that you're watching that you would write about well i it's almost anything like if i watch a film and it really intrigues me and things start to come up in my head i just write down a review cool brilliant it's good to keep those writing muscles flexed i think (laughs) (laughs) I, I, I would. Uh, do you know how I flexed my writing muscles over the summer? Uh-huh. <laughs> Emails to <Eight> you. <laughs> <laughs> I, like, like I can. The, yeah. <laughs> this this summer, this just <laughs> I just have to tell some humans about this. <laughs> that understandably, the, the I university mean, that I work for has done some really serious reorganizing of itself over the summer, which has per- mm. which meant that we've had to just replan all of our teaching, and so the summer is where we normally do research that's just been wiped out completely Mm -hmm. so uh that's gone so the only outlet Mm -hmm. that i've had over the past three four months for doing any thinking through actual ideas has been dissertation supervision (laughs) and so i've had uh i've had onodja i've had a student writing about uh representations of um uh Muslims in American films. I've had a student writing about Doyin, so the, the Chinese version of TikTok. Uh, I've had a student writing about Spike Lee. Mm-hmm. And I've had a student writing about uh, journalistic representations of the civil war in Syria. So oh, wow. I've just been vicariously doing research <laughs> over the summer. So this is uh, uh, an attempt just to put some of uh, these uh, thoughts down in a form that's more than just uh, a distation. Although I, I probably shouldn't put the word just before the word distation, should I? Because <laughs> what it's 18,000 words mm-hmm. worth a third of an entire a degree. Uh, and it's, if it's something that you intend to continue to do, mm-hmm. I always recommend that your master's distation should be the, the basis of the very first scholarly article that mm-hmm. you get published. It was, it, for me, it was the basis of one of my entire research areas. Uh, right. It was the cultural history of menstruation. And you feel the same way about your master's, Paula, don't you? That this was the beginning of part of you? There were definitely mm. seeds in mine. Yes, <clears throat> I wrote mine about uh, surrealism and documentary. And that's something that has never left to me. That I'm, that's something I'm still working through, I think, yeah. And all degrees should be one-year degrees. Yeah. <laughs> Enough of this three-year nonsense. <laughs> Do it in one. 
The master's is so special. It's my, yeah. it was definitely my favorite. The dissertation was my favorite, favorite ever thing. So. It's because people just left you alone for, for, for a long time, <laughs> wasn't it? You were ready to be left alone at that point. Um, I'm not sure what you're going to do next, long term. Well, I think writing is just always going to be a part of me. So films as well. So right now I'm just looking for any editorial positions that are open up. But recently I've actually, in fact today, I've had the opportunity to work with a really renowned Indian photographer. He's a, mm. a specialist in panorama pictures and he um, goes about photographing um, the lesser known architecture and historical buildings in India. So things which are literally left behind or nobody talks about mm. anymore. So he's doing a project and it's literally a voluntary position. So I don't know if I'm taking mm -hmm. it yet, but he's asked me to lead a group of um, storytellers. So basically I'll be looking at all the scripts that go online for the project. So that is something that's, that might be happening over the course of three to six months from now. Rest, apart from that, I'm just looking for <laughs> jobs at the moment. Yeah. And, doing a bit of writing here and there. So I continue to write for the university and my own blog, of course. So yeah, a lot of writing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Great, well, like open door. If you ever wanna come back and chat about whatever you're working on, it'd be really lovely to hear from you. I've really enjoyed this so much, thank you. And thank you for having me here. This is seriously one of the most wonderful opportunities I've received yet. Oh. <laughs> Just amazing your bar is very low Arnold. <laughs> <laughs> no it isn't <laughs> working with andrew is like outside of uni i'm just like holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> well um uh one of the reasons we're doing this is that i'm not marking your master's dissertation Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so, in in something like five weeks mm -hmm. um you'll have um another degree Yay. Uh, and <laughs> one that one that really like the as the figures indicate that having a master's degree really does give you an edge on people when it comes to getting management level jobs although yeah. i don't think any of us want to get a management level job <laughs> no i don't, um, I don't. So, yeah maybe you're going down exactly the right route of selling your labor for absolutely zero money <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This last. i'm gonna press a big red button yeah right. well okay. good luck with everything Arnoja and thank honestly you. yeah keep in touch it'd be lovely to hear from you again thank you so much thank you for having me this has been audiovisual cultures with me Paula Blair and my very special guests Andrew Shale and Anoja Shri this episode was recorded using Zoom. It was edited by me, Paula Blair. The music is Common Ground by Airtone, licensed under a Creative Commons 3.0 non-commercial attribution. Be part of the conversation with AV Cultures on Facebook and Twitter and AV Cultures Pod on Instagram. Always happy to hear from people who would like to participate in the podcast, so you can drop me a line at any of those or see our website at www.audiovisualcultures.wordpress.com or email audiovisual cultures at gmail.com if you like to get some perks with your podcasts you can join at patreon and access episodes a day early thanks so much for listening be excellent to each other and catch you next time bye